Memricus Emilius Lepidus Livianus, Consul 77 BCE. One of the best examples of a Roman figure who was preeminent during his own time but has since faded into obscurity, Livianus was one of the chief pillars of the Solon order. He was the biological brother of Livius Drusus the Younger, and then he went on to rise to prominence under Sulla, who was his father-in-law. Later, he became the princeps senatus, and he died as one of the most respected men in all of Rome. So why was he not better remembered, and why is he not talked about more often? In this video, I hope to establish that Livianus was in fact a very important player, and also speculate as to why he has not been better remembered. Mamercus Livianus was actually born as Mamercus Livius Drusus. Most likely he was the second son of Marcus Livius Drusus the Elder, who served as consul in 112, but more famously and more importantly, was one of the tribunes who opposed Gaius Gracchus during one of his later tribunates. And he was instrumental at that time in undermining Gaius Gracchus's popularity. His father, Drusus the Elder, died in 108, so young Mamercus was most likely fatherless by his teenage years. His brother, Marcus Livius Drusus the Younger, was born in the year 124, and most scholars estimate that Mamercus was two years younger than his brother. Livianus was adopted by the Emilii Lepidi, one of the most prominent branches of one of Rome's most prominent patrician families. The number of people bearing the name Emilius is legion. So this was an even better connection than the one that he was born into. That kind of thing would happen when a branch of the family did not have a male heir and they needed someone to carry on the family name. So if a family that was friendly happened to have an extra son, then they would often allow that son to be adopted by this other family and carry on the name. The advantage to this was the political connection that it would bring and also by getting to inherit another entire estate, what happens is that each of the two sons is better provided for in the long run. So this was actually quite advantageous to Drusus the Elder in so far as he was looking out for the best interest of his sons in the long run. Livianus's early career is largely unknown to us. However, since he went from one of the most noble plebeian families into one of the most noble patrician families, one has to imagine that his life was quite easy, especially when compared with people who were trying to make a name for themselves or whose families had fallen out of favor in recent decades. However, in 91, Livianus would face his first kind of challenge when his brother suddenly became a household name in Rome. In the year 91, Drusus the Younger was elected as tribune. Now, for the most part, tribunes who came from the noble plebeian families didn't cause too much uh, trouble. The Gracchi had been somewhat of an anomaly. However, in this case, um, Drusus the Younger was a reformer who was trying to reform in favor of the Senate. However, one controversial measure that he was trying to push, which was not clearly in favor of the Senate, but was very much clearly in favor of the continued solidarity of the Roman world, was to pass a bill giving full citizenship to Latin and Italian citizens. Latin and Italian citizens had been fighting in Rome's wars for centuries, and while they had shared in the hardships, they had not been reaping the same benefits by a long shot. So Drusus's goal was to address that wrong and to prevent a civil war. Pressure was at the boiling point as many of the opponents of giving the franchise to the Italian and Latin citizens were very vigorous in their opposition to the point of violence and many of the Italians were actually present in Rome as well and they were showing their support for citizenship, also employing violence when necessary. At any rate, there was some kind of rally, 
and during it, Drusus happened to be stabbed, and he died within a few hours. With his murder, this meant that the Italian allies now knew that they didn't have a reliable champion in the Senate working toward their interest, and they decided that it was time to go their own way, revolt, and form their own government. Livianus's attitude on the issue of citizenship is completely unknown to us, and we also don't really have any idea of how he felt about his brother's other measures. We know that in his later years he was known as being a staunch optimate, but that doesn't really tell us much about how he felt um, about his brother's performance as tribune. After all, his brother had gone pretty far in terms of bending what most conservative senators thought was acceptable for a tribune to do, even if his policies had been fairly conservative and status quo defending. Um, so it, it's hard to really know how Livianus would have felt about his brother's political legacy. When the war broke out, Livianus served for the entirety of the conflict. Most likely he would have felt that his personal honor was at stake since his brother had fought so hard to try to prevent this war. So if he agreed with his brother, he would have thought that this was a way to allay any suspicions about his loyalty to Rome. However, if he opposed his brother, this would be a way to right the wrong that his brother had been trying to pull off and to bring the allies to heel. We don't know for certain, but most likely Liviana served as a legate under Quintus Caecilius Metellus Pius, the son of the famous would-be conqueror of the Numidians. Drusus' death had some concrete ramifications for Livianus' life and career. First of all, when Drusus died, he vacated a seat on the College of Pontiffs, and Livianus was elected to fill his brother's seat. One can speculate about the possible implications of Livianus being elected to fill his brother's seat. It could reflect some lingering popularity for Drusus the Younger, or it could simply reflect that the Senate was backing Livianus in order to prevent him from going the path of his brother. It's not entirely clear, and we don't really have much evidence to go on. At home, Drusus had been the guardian of Cato the Younger, Portia, and Servilia, who later became the mother of Brutus and the mistress of Gaius Julius Caesar. The way that he had come into possession of these children is a somewhat complex tale of how um, elite marriages worked, especially with frequent divorces. And if you want to learn all of the details of this, I suggest that you refer back to my video on Drusus the Younger. At any rate, because Drusus had been the guardian of these children, it is very likely that his brother Livianus now came into possession of them. And while one of the children was the biological daughter of Caipio the Younger, who was still alive at this time, he too would soon die, which would then put the question of custody back onto the table. So either at the death of Drusus or the later death of Caipio, it is quite likely that guardianship for these three children went to Livianus in 91. We know for a fact that Sulla spent quite a bit of time with the young Cato the Younger, and that he was Livianus' future father-in-law just a few years after 91. So, most likely there is a strong connection there, and that the time that Sulla spent with Cato was no coincidence, but rather a matter of convenience since he was his grandson-in-law. I'm assuming grandson-in-law is a real thing, I just kind of made up that term. But at any rate, most likely um, Livianus' household became a fuller house due to his brother's death. Quintus Papaidius Silo had been one of Drusus's closest friends during his last days. An Italian nobleman who had served on multiple campaigns, Silo was pushing hard for the inclusion of Latin and Italian allies as full citizens of Rome. He had even visited Drusus's home and supposedly met with Drusus's children, teasingly asking them about what they thought about this whole issue. 
It's not entirely clear whether his late brother's association with Silo was a political liability or not, but one can't help but suspect that Livianus was fairly eager to prove that he did not share his brother's affiliations with Italian leaders, especially after the Italians started winning victories and one of their best and most successful leaders happened to be his late brother's BFF. During the citizenship debate, Silo had actually led around 10,000 Italians to Rome to try to agitate for the passage of the citizenship law. Due to the speed with which the Italian revolt broke out following the death of Drusus, it is likely that Silo and other Italian leaders had been plotting something for a long time and that their preparations were quite advanced to potentially go their own way. They quickly formed a government, which seems to be something of a mirror of Rome's own government, and Silo was elected as one of the two consuls of this new Italian Republic. He was elected to lead the Marsic tribes in the west, while he had a colleague who led the Samnite tribes in the east. Silo proved himself to be an able general, and during the early phases of the war, he won several victories, including one where he defeated and killed the praetor, Caipio the Younger. That is why earlier when I mentioned that the children could have gone to Caipio, but it doesn't really matter because ultimately uh, Livianus would be on the hook for inheriting care of the children. Uh, that's why I said all that. By 88 BCE, the combination of political concessions and victories by generals such as Pompeius, Strabo, and Sulla meant that the Italian cause had become a long shot. However, Silo was still alive and still leading the resistance at the city of Venusia. Livianus was part of the army that was laying siege to Venusia, and in 88, they stormed the city. During the battle, perhaps in single combat, perhaps in a chaotic melee, Livianus managed to personally slay his brother's old friend. That means that he killed one of the most important Italian leaders, which in itself is a great distinction, and also achieved at a blow great progress toward ending the social war. Silo at that point was one of the few major leaders left, and his death would have deflated the morale of any remaining rebels. It's possible that since the Italians were largely franchised after the Social War, that some of the lackluster performance that Livianus had when he ran for office in subsequent years could owe to Italian resentment for his role in killing someone they regarded as a great hero. But again, I'm just speculating. It's rarely entirely clear why some candidates in Roman elections struggled a little bit while others won handily, especially when we're comparing people who are very well connected and well placed. Following the conclusion of the social war early in the year, the rest of 88 was mostly a political contest between Sulla, who was one of the consuls and had been the best general during the social war, and the ambitious tribune Publius Sulpicius Rufus, who was reviving the popularis tradition that had been embodied most recently by Saturninus. During one of their scuffles in the forum, Sulla's son-in-law Quintus Pompeius Rufus, who was coincidentally the son of his consular colleague and shared the same name, died in one of these fracases. So this meant that Sulla's daughter Cornelia was now a widow and Sulla was looking for a suitable son-in-law who would help to shore up the prestige of himself and his family. At this point, he was still not a dictator. At an unknown point, but probably not too long after the death of Quintus Pompeius Rufus, Sulla arranged for Livianus to become his new son-in-law and to marry Cornelia. It's not entirely clear if Livianus and Cornelia had any children together, but it does seem like they remained as a couple until the end of both of their respective lives. So they had one of the longer marriages of Roman aristocrats, 
Um, part of the reason why Livianus inherited or probably inherited the guardianship of all of the children that I mentioned is precisely because of just how common aristocratic divorces were. So if, as I suspect, they remained married as long as they did, that was actually quite rare. At a later date, um, this is probably when this young man would have come of age, Cornelius son, who is also named Quintus Pompeius Rufus, just like his grandfather and father before him, sued his mother over not inheriting some of the lands that should, by rights, be his. Um, most likely, those lands were being used by the subject of our video, Livianus. There's also a tradition that Cornelia shared her father's exile during the 80s, when her father was fighting Mithridates and Marius and Senna were running things in Rome. If, as I suspect, Cornelia and Livianus were wed in the early 80s, this would most likely mean that Livianus shared in Sulla's um, campaign in the East and his removal from Rome during those years. However, it's not entirely clear that that was the case, and we actually have no direct mentions of Livianus um, in the aftermath of his performance in the Social War. All we know is that he became Sulla's son-in-law before Sulla became dictator. Sulla returned to Rome victorious in 83, and the most important task before him in those early days was to rid himself of all of the Marian and Sinan loyalists who were around. He got into a dispute with a young Gaius Julius Caesar early because Caesar was not only the nephew of Gaius Marius, but was also the son-in-law of Senna. When Caesar refused to renounce his wife, Senna's daughter, Sulla became angry and contemplated having the young man executed. He claimed that he could see many, many Mariuses within Caesar and saw him as a future threat to both his own legacy and the state at least if Plutarch's somewhat poetic account is to be believed. However, his son-in-law, the more level-headed Livianus, convinced Sulla that this was not a wise course of action, and perhaps Livianus was thinking of potential blowback. After all, if you killed a teenager for having an attitude, that would not come off as statesmanlike or wise, and it would be very hard to justify this murder as being an act of state. You could possibly justify killing some of the Sinans uh, who were adults and who were fully responsible for their actions since they themselves had engaged in similar acts. But to kill a teenager would have been a step too far and it would have also extinguished a line of Roman patricians. Most likely Livianus's thinking was driven by those considerations and in the immediate and intermediate futures that would prove to be a prudent um, piece of advice. There was no way to know, of course, that Caesar would go on to become a dictator who would be much more successful than Sulla. This deed alone shows a couple of things about Livianus. One is that he was deeply influential with his father-in-law and that he was not just a name and an estate that Sulla was trying to get on his side. Another thing is that by saving Julius Caesar's life from Sulla, Livianus, by that one act alone, is an impactful historical figure and deserves a footnote. Um, Caesar's life at a few different points was in danger, and any time that you save the endangered life of someone who would go on to fundamentally alter the destiny of an entire civilization, I think in that case, you yourself are qualified to have a nice footnote somewhere in the textbook. Given that Livianus was the younger brother of someone who had been immensely popular, that he was a war hero in his own right, and that he was the son-in-law of Sulla who was still in power during this period, one has to wonder why Livianus struggled so much electorally. Now, he achieved all of the high offices, to be sure, but he didn't quite achieve it as easily as one might imagine. 
After his first bid for the praetorship failed, Livianus ran again and was able to win the office in 81. Three years later, he would have been eligible for the consulship, but he waited an additional year and then ran in the year 77. This was the year after his father-in-law's death, so to be fair, his primary patron was now removed from the scene. He had been largely retired a couple years before that anyway, but now that he was truly dead, there would be some jockeying for position among Sulla's chief lieutenants. Because of the possibility of crisis, perhaps, um, people began to look to Livianus for some kind of guidance since he had been one of the pillars of the Sullan regime. I'm assuming this because before, um, early on during this race for the consulship of 77, which would have occurred in 78, the year that Sulla died, Livianus was initially not doing that well. It appears that he was on path to finish third or fourth and go home empty-handed. However, when Gaius Scribonius Curio dropped out for reasons unknown and endorsed Livianus, he was then able to secure the consulship. The whole thing is odd. Um, perhaps because people predicted a crisis coming, they wanted to turn to a trusted war hero. Um, perhaps conservative senators wanted someone who was proven and battle-tested. It's also simply possible that, say, Gaius Scribonius Curio was ill and thought he was going to die and wanted his friend to be consul. We don't know. All we know is that on paper, Livianus should have been a political powerhouse, but in practice, he was somewhat weak. That is why I speculated earlier that he had a weakness with Italian, former Italian and Latin voters who would now constitute around 40% of the electorate or so. We don't have anything like a full picture of the year 77 or even of the revolt of Lepidus. However, it is very safe to say that the revolt of Lepidus was the dominant event of the year and that this would have been the most important thing by a long shot which occurred while Livianus was the consul. We also know that Livianus took to the field with troops. However, we don't really have a very solid idea of what he actually did during the revolt of Lepidus. This is because of the state of our sources. We have several different sources for the revolt of Lepidus, but all of their accounts of this event are extremely fragmentary and limited. And surprisingly, the name of Livianus doesn't come up even once. And you would think that because this guy is a war hero and because he was Sola's son-in-law, that he would have featured very prominently in the course of events during this revolt. Either he didn't actually do that much, maybe he was assigned by lot to one of the secondary theaters, or else this is simply an accident of survival. We don't know. But um, despite the fact that he was consul during one of the most pivotal years of the late Roman Republic, his consulship is shrouded in obscurity. And what makes things even worse and even odder is that we actually don't have any evidence that he received the proconsular province after his time as consul. It was not a universal thing that consuls would get a proconsular command until the laws that Pompey helped pass later on in the 50s, but given the status of Livianus and his stature, you would think that he would be one of the men who would want to go win further acclaim abroad. For whatever reason, he chose not to. Perhaps he thought that he was needed in Rome. Or perhaps he simply wasn't deemed worthy by his colleagues. Maybe they didn't want him to be able to fully claim the mantle of Sulla. After all, Sulla's younger male relatives, such as his nephew Publius, weren't old enough to claim it. And, uh, you know, perhaps they just wanted to avoid having a someone be too preeminent. And Pompey was already on the rise anyway, so um, perhaps it was too late to stop Pompey by building up someone else. What we can say with a great deal of security is that Livianus remained one of the most respected and 
well thought of men in Rome for the remainder of his life. However, the role that he actually played in politics seems to have been rather meager. He doesn't show up very often in our sources for the remaining um, 16 or so years of his life following his consulship. It's pretty likely that he took part in the campaign against Crete as one of the major legates. Um, Marcus Antonius was given quite a bit of authority to um, raise large forces to go after the pirates, and most likely he would have needed experienced men with good name recognition as some of his lieutenants, so Livianus would have been available. Most likely, if he uh, was available, he was used. We don't know for sure, though. By the year 70 or so, he was the Princep Senatus. All we know is that he eventually acquired that title. We don't know exactly when. Um, and also in the tradition of many of the Princep Senatus holders after Marcus Aemilius Scarus, um, he was somewhat of a non-entity in the role. He didn't really seem to shine or to really direct affairs in any meaningful way. He was more or less just the um, grand old man of the state, someone who was a nice symbol for the Senate, but didn't really command all that much um, in terms of being able to direct policy or steer the state. During the so-called First Catalinarian Conspiracy of 66 to 65, which was effectively just a disputed consular election. It had very little to do with Catiline, and it certainly wasn't related in any meaningful sense to the real Catalinarian conspiracy to uh, set fires in Rome, kill a bunch of senators, and allow Catiline and his friends to get rid of their debts. Um, Livianus was called as a hostile witness against Gaius Cornelius. So somehow he was still involved in some of the electoral canvassing that went on during this campaign. So people were able to call on him as a witness. And because he was the Princeps Senatus, his testimony could be quite devastating. He died around 62 BCE. Um, if not uh, at that exact date, then it would have been in one of the years right around it because he's not mentioned after that time. And um, with that, the reason we know is actually because then you get a new Princep Senatus um, Catulus. As he lay dying, it would be interesting to know what Livianus thought his legacy would be. What in his mind would stand out as his most significant achievement? As a good Roman aristocrat, he most likely felt that his continuation of the Emilii Lepidi line would be the thing that he would be remembered for, his most important contribution to Rome. He would have also pointed to his consulship and whatever it was that he did to um, defeat the conspiracy of Lepidus. Uh, Livianus could have also pointed to his role in helping to end the social war by killing Silo. However, now that we have the benefit of hindsight, and we can look upon Rome as a whole, we can look upon its whole history, we can very safely say that his most important contribution was his very simple piece of advice to his father-in-law Sola not to kill the teenage Julius Caesar. For Livianus, even though he lived in a time when Caesar was becoming increasingly prominent, uh, at the time of his death I mean, he really would have had no idea that Caesar would go on to be such a world historical figure. And even if he had known, um, the thing is his decision to um, advise his father-in-law to not kill Caesar most likely occurred to him as a common sense stance that wasn't really worth repeating. If Caesar ever thanked him, I'm sure that he was like, yeah, of course. I mean, that's the obvious thing to do, the obviously decent course of action. Uh, you don't really owe me a thanks for that. This is a common sense thing. Yet that one small act of um, political self-preservation slash um, incidental kindness ended up being the most important thing that Livianus ever did. His primary significance, um, especially in retrospect, but even in his own time to some extent, 
was being a secondary or tertiary figure in the lives of more important men. His brother would have been one of the heavy hitters for years had he lived, and Livianus kind of filled his shoes a little bit, but not quite. Um, it's comparable to how Ted Kennedy owed his career to the fame of his two brothers, and while he became a very well-known senator, he was certainly no JFK. Livianus' relationship with his brother is somewhat comparable. He also played a major role in ensuring the survival of both the orphan Cato the Younger and of Julius Caesar. In ancient biographies, such as the ones that Plutarch wrote, it is thought that the character of someone is just innate and inborn, and that Cato was born a conservative firebrand. But in all likelihood, growing up as the ward of Sulla's son-in-law really played a role in forming Cato's conservatism, uh, especially when combined with him learning about his ancestor Cato the Elder. So I imagine that if Cato had grown up in a different household, he may have turned out a fair amount differently. And as for ensuring the survival of the young Julius Caesar, that was, you know, a an event that took place in maybe five minutes, but it ended up being something of world historical significance. His slaying of Silo was most likely the most important and acclaimed act of bravery during the Social War. So while his father-in-law Sulla was the best general of the war, one could argue that Livianus was the best soldier during the war. Despite his mediocre electoral performances and his unremarkable political skills, he was widely respected and rewarded with the honor of being named as Princeps Senatus. Um, now, while I personally feel, looking at the evidence, that the title of Princeps Senatus was more or less a citizenship award or a sportsmanship award, if you will, that's still a major honor, and I'm sure that in Livianus's mind, this was the greatest day of his life when he was named as the Princeps Senatus. I imagine even he, though, wouldn't think that being named that uh, would be his greatest accomplishment, even if it was his greatest honor. So anyway, that was the life of Livianus, the brother of Drusus the Younger.